John McManus is one of the great emerging uh, historians. Uh, he, his method of telling history is much of what Harold did. He, he takes the stories of the veterans, he takes the facts as is documented and tries to uh, uh, mix the two together. And I think that's one of the reasons for his great popularity. So tonight, I'd like to, to speak to you about that bitter struggle for Bastogne, uh, and specifically uh, the importance of the first phase of that struggle, uh, from December 16th through the 20th, primarily. Uh, and that's when small groups of American soldiers uh, who were nearly overwhelmed by remarkably powerful German formations, uh, held out long enough to buy time for reinforcements, uh, most notably from the 101st Airborne Division, to consolidate American control on the vital crossroads town of, uh, of Bastogne and to help thwart Hitler's famous Ardennes Offensive. So uh, I do believe that this is a, a key moment in the, in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and the story of the, the race for Bastogne the Bastogne Corridor uh, is a story of human drama, uh, pathos, privation, uh, destruction, uh, and yes, even vulgarity. Uh, but it is, it is in the end, uh, a very powerful human story. What emerged from, uh, from this kind of journey into the past uh, was, I felt, a pretty remarkable tale of ordinary Americans triumphing over the odds, uh, denying Bastogne to a determined and very powerful enemy who badly needed that town. Uh, now, why did they need Bastogne so badly? There were three reasons, in my view. Uh, one, Seven Roads Converged There. One of the most popular books about Bastogne is called Seven Roads to Hell by Donald Burgett. It's a perfect title because Seven Roads Converged There. That's why the town is important to a great extent. It's a crossroads to many places in the Ardennes. And uh, so, if you are to advance through the Ardennes, you need it as a route of advance and you need it for your communications. That's one. Two. Uh, they needed it, the Germans did, as a place to bring up supplies and reinforcements. It's a natural staging area, natural choke point. Uh, this is exactly where their columns are going to have to go through, most probably. Uh, three, they need it as a pivot point for their drive on the Meurs. Uh, the Meurs River, which is to the north, uh, as, as many of you can, can tell from the map there. Let me get my little pointer here. Um, you know, they're wanting to go farther north now, okay? So they need that crossroads town as a pivot point to go farther north cross that river, the, the Meurs, and get to Antwerp, which is the ultimate objective. Um, now, General Hasso von Manteuffel was commander of the 5th Panzer Army that had this, this mission of, of overwhelming the Bastogne Corridor. Um, and uh, Bob had the, the opportunity to conduct many, many interviews with General von Manteuffel uh, because Bob was stationed in Europe for, for uh, quite a few years as an historian. So he, he knew Van Teufel well, interviewed him several times, and Van Teufel had told Bob that he planned to take Bastogne on the second day of the offensive. That's December 17th. Uh, so he needed it and planned to take it quickly. Uh, and that's one of the key messages I'd like to get across to you, uh, that speed is of the essence for the Germans. They have to have Bastogne very quickly. And when they failed to, to get it, uh, Van Teufel admitted to Bob uh, that he felt that uh, his offensive was in some trouble. Uh, so speed is of utmost importance. The German offensive uh, in the battle that we come to know as the Battle of the Bulge is a major gamble, as you all realize. Uh, it's dependent upon surprise, I get that, uh, mainly because of Allied intelligence failures. Uh, bad weather, they get that because of you know, the time of year and the place. Uh, you're likely to get a lot of bad weather in mid-December in the Ardennes. They get that. And a minute, and I mean almost down to the to the second or minute timetable. Okay? Everything has to develop quickly for the Germans. It is a matter of dash, mobility, and speed if this thing is to play out. The ultimate goal of the offensive, as I've mentioned, is to get to Antwerp. What's the purpose of that? To cut uh, the two major Allied armies in two, uh, Montgomery, the British and the Canadians, up north in uh, Belgium and Holland, cut them off from the Americans, and to, to drive a wedge both literally and figuratively, in the Allied coalition and perhaps salvage some semblance of Nazi Germany and, in a perfect case scenario, bring in the Western powers uh, into the war against the Soviets in the East. Uh, pretty ambitious goals. So you can see, uh, if you're the Germans on the ground, uh, you have a kind of a zero defect uh, offensive here. Not a whole lot can go wrong. Okay? Uh, so in the, in the Bastogne Quarter, as everywhere else, this is the crucial element. 
speed and uh, things going according to plan. So I would argue then that Bastogne was much more valuable to the Germans on December 17th when General Manteuffel envisioned getting it than uh, over a week later on Christmas Day, December 25th, when, when desperate fighting was still going on around there. When they failed to take the town within their timetable, or even within five days, Bastogne's importance then began to diminish as the, the German offensive began to, to come uh, unhinged. Uh, so it went from a useful pivot point, which they would have had at the beginning, to a very powerful symbol, and in that case, a symbol of American resistance to this overwhelming German attack. Uh, so by December 20th, 21st, uh, when the siege began, it had turned into a battle of attrition. And we all know the Germans probably were not going to come out ahead of the Americans in, the battle, in a battle of attrition at that point. Uh, so uh, that's why I focused on the time period I did in the book, uh, December 16th through the 20th. Uh, and that's when the Americans won, won the race for the town. Um, now in saying that, I want to be very clear about something. Uh, I am not, again, repeat not, uh, <laughs> diminishing the achievements of those who served during the siege. 101st Airborne, CCB, 10th Armored, uh, others who were fighting within the town as well. Uh, I am not diminishing that in the least. Um, uh, that stands forever, as it should. Uh, it, and it is a powerful legacy of valor and determination. And I don't want to take a, a thing away from that. I'm just simply saying, uh, that for the Germans, uh, they had a much better chance of reaping Bastogne's benefits earlier rather than later. Uh, that Bastogne had, had, in the bigger picture, uh, begun to, to diminish as time went on. Uh, and it, it would have helped them achieve their objectives much greater in the first two to three days uh, than later on if they'd gotten it, say, after Christmas. Um, so while I'm on the Ardennes, uh, as I had set it up, as I'll, I'll describe it tonight, uh, it's the story of three distinct groups of American soldiers uh, fighting in the Bastogne Corridor. Uh, group one uh, is from December 16th through the 18th is the 28th Infantry Division. Uh, now the 28th Division fought, <coughs> excuse me, ferociously in a, in a series of small Luxembourg towns uh, that had uh, tremendous importance because of the terrain. Uh, because the terrain was so rough, there's a lot of forested area, there's gorges and bluffs, uh, the, the road net is narrow, uh, some of the roads are not paved, even the paved roads are, are narrow and, and uh, gravelly, uh, the weather isn't good, so you're, you're dependent upon little choke points here in these various small towns. Then it kind of gives way to a little bit more of a plateau, rolling plateau, but again, kind of tough for tanks and other vehicles to move out there uh, in that ground because they can get bogged down very easily. So the Germans are kind of road bound, at least with their vehicles, and vehicles are what determine mobility here. Um, so, uh, so the 28th Division is fighting in those Luxembourg towns in and around them for those first three days quite desperately. Uh, the second group is uh, uh, throughout December 18th, soldiers from uh, Combat Command Reserve, or CCR, 9th Armored Division, uh, basically sacrifice themselves at uh, several small uh, but very important road junctions right on the Luxembourg-Belgian border, uh, about 10 miles east of Bastogne. And, they tend to be uh, quite anonymous in the, in the entire story. Uh, and, I, and I must say, quite honestly, it was very difficult tracking down accounts from them beyond just the, the records. Uh, but I, I, I found as much as I could. I always would have wanted more. But they tend to get lost in the, in the story of, of uh, the race for Bastogne, and I wanted to, to do something about that. So that's uh, the second group. And that, in the end, they bought just a few hours, uh, but it was enough. Three, the book reaches a climax on December 19th and 20th. Uh, when soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division and Combat Command B, 10th Armored, uh, successfully held off potent attempts to capture Bastogne, uh, especially in the environs of the town. Little small towns uh, that are just outside of Bastogne that are the gateway points into, uh, into this, this uh, kind of compacted market town. All right, well, start with the, the 28th Division. Uh, if, you, if you could move ahead to the, to the next uh, slide, please, or the next map. Okay. Okay, here you see uh, how the 28th Division is set up. Uh, this is what I generally call the Bastogne Corridor. Uh, now that's a judgment call. Uh, I kind of limited it to the, to the 28th IDs uh, uh, sector, which ironically enough was 28 miles long, way too much for a division to cover. Uh, probably about twice as much ground as a division should cover in the, in the view of most of the generals at that time. 
Uh, so Allied forces, American forces, are spread very thin in the Ardennes, and as General Omar Bradley will later say, that's a calculated risk. Um, that you couldn't be strong everywhere, uh, thus you had to choose some places where you'd be weaker than others. And, and the Ardennes seemed to be a, nor a, a logical place because of the terrain, because it's good defensible terrain. So the 28th ID, as you see, uh, is really spread out here, uh, all up and down that 28 mile uh, corridor. Uh, now, they're gonna be right there in the center when Hitler's offensive comes. <laughs> better part of 5th Panzer Army just avalanches on the 28th ID, particularly the middle regiment, the 110th Infantry Regiment. Um, and the 28th Division had already done more than a share of fighting in this war. Uh, they had fought in Normandy, had had uh, some, some bitter fights in Normandy. Uh, they had fought in the Siegfried Line uh, in the fall of 1944, uh, and perhaps most famously, they had fought at the Hurricane Forest. Uh, soon before the Battle of the Bulge, and that was, uh, you know, primarily November 1944. And some of you know just how horrible uh, Battle of the Hurricane Forest truly was, um, and and the kind of casualties the division had taken. I mean, the division took uh, between six and seven thousand casualties at Hurricane alone. So they get moved after that uh, here into uh, the Ardennes uh, to rest. <laughs> uh, so in December, there they are in their quiet sector. Uh, they're going to get replacements. They're going to sort of lick their wounds. Uh, they're going to reform and refit, uh, get back in shape physically, you know, through training and through eating better food, and maybe some hot meals and a little entertainment here and there, and maybe get their minds back in gear too. After what many of them had experienced at uh, at Hurricane, they're going to they're going to uh, sort of meld in many of the new replacements, and most of the guys are going to be replacements. Uh, this is supposed to be a, a quiet place, uh, but it's anything but, obviously. Uh, instead. Instead of that nice, quiet vacation, uh, they get to face an all-out enemy offensive. Uh, so, pick your poison. Uh, on December 16th, when this whole thing happens, two of the division's regiments, the 110th and the 112th, uh, again, I'll just kind of outline this for you, the area I'm talking about here, right up here. The 110th is in this sector here. Uh, their headquarters is here at Clairvaux, beautiful little town, uh, like a uh, little uh, tourist town. Uh, about 4,000 people, situated in a low, uh, low bowl between two prominent ridges. Um, so you see the 110th here, and then the 112th up here. Uh, the first battalion of which is kind of nosed into the, just the western edge of Germany there at that point. A little town, Sevenig, uh, Harsfeld, and of course uh, Lutz Kampen, uh up there. Now those two regiments alone deal with elements of six German divisions on December 16th. Six German divisions. Uh, I'll listen for you. Uh, fifth parachute, Panzer Lair, 26th Volksgrenadier, 2nd Panzer, 560th uh, Volksgrenadier, and 116th Panzer. Uh, most of these guys are not uh, second tier guys, especially in the, in the Panzer units. Uh, this is some of their best remaining soldiers and a lot of their best remaining firepower and equipment. Uh, the regiments, as you, as you may get a sense of from looking at the map here, don't really have a continuous front line. Uh, in, in many cases, they are outposting either along the Ore River or just across it um, during the day, and then they come back at night uh, into the towns. Uh, and outposting basically means a few guys out there near the river or on either side of it just, just kind of watching to see what the Germans do, uh, making sure that everything's under control uh, at, that, at that point, okay? But very vulnerable. <laughs> extremely vulnerable there. So that's what those little dots mean, little outposts. But most of the time, you know, the companies are concentrated in and around the various towns, in houses or in little uh, uh, foxholes and fortifications uh, around the various towns at those choke points. Uh, so there is no continuous front lines. Um, not at all. Far from it. Um, the, the time when this offensive began was early in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. Uh, and it began on most of the, the, uh, the sector, especially down here, with a massive artillery barrage, a uh, German artillery barrage. Um, shelling was noisy, uh, it was destructive of buildings, and especially communications wire, uh, but it inflicted few casualties on the, on the 28th Division soldiers. Uh, most of them were hunkered down in houses uh, or other buildings and barns, or they had dug in pretty well. They had uh, you know, many, many days to do that. Uh, so they dug pretty decent fighting positions for themselves that, that provided some level of cover from, uh, from the shelling. Didn't mean there were no casualties, but 
uh, so casualties were surprisingly light considering uh, how many artillery shells the Germans threw at them. Uh, but it did disrupt communications quite a bit. It, it tore up the wires uh, to a great extent. Um, the Germans really had little trouble advancing to the American uh, positions uh, in and around the towns. Um, very little, very little trouble at all. Now, I'll just show you, uh, you know, what happens at a few of these places. Okay. Uh, here's Hosingen. Okay, you can see uh, you've got K Company, the 110th Infantry there, and you have engineers. Uh, B Company, 103rd Engineers, are clustered in that town. It's right along uh, one of the main road nets there that the Americans call the Skyline Drive, uh, which is a uh, uh, was, was the name of a major highway in Virginia at that time, and it reminded many Americans of that highway, so that's why they call this the Skyline Drive. Uh, so that's where some of the heaviest fighting will take place. Uh, down here at Weiler, where I Company of the 110th Infantry is, uh, they're going to run into to, to powerful assaults, uh, as these arrows indicate. These arrows generally mean really bad things. Uh, a lot of Germans coming at you. So where you see arrows, that's where you don't want to be. Uh, you've got uh, B Company, 110th, right there in Marnock. Uh, this is just a nice little uh, market town, just a few miles east of Clairvaux there, just over the plateau. Um, and you've got A Company up at uh, Heinerscheid, and you've got uh, the 1st Battalion of the, the 112th Infantry clustered up here, most notably B Company of the 112th, uh, up there uh, around Lutzkampen, uh, which is a German town, a B Company 112, and of course that's that's the unit uh, that Charlie Hogg was a part of. Uh, that he, he'll tell you about his experiences there. So so that's the basic setup, and the, these are the units that, that just absorb the brunt of these uh, these German attacks. And as I said, the Germans don't have a trouble have any trouble infiltrating; they have trouble overwhelming uh, the, these American garrisons. Um, every one of these places. Uh, the, the com each company fought very, very hard uh, when the German attack happened against very overwhelming odds. In some cases, it's 10 to 1 odds. In some cases, it's 2 or 3 to 1 odds. Uh, there's not all that much armored support, either from Sherman tanks or from tank destroyers. There's some artillery support, although at Hosingen, uh, most of the, the after-action reports and accounts claim that not one American artillery shell uh, fell around the town in support, and yet uh, the, the K Company and the engineers held up there for three days. If you, can, if you can believe that. Um, uh, a lot of these uh, soldiers of the 28th Division, whose, uh, whose nickname was the Bloody Bucket, this is Pennsylvania National Guard Division, that Omar Bradley had once commanded, um, a lot of them uh, are just fighting hard enough to hold up the Germans for a useful amount of time. Okay? There's no way they can hold out for good. It can't be done, but they're holding out for just enough time, and they're hoping that maybe they'll get some uh, reinforcements. They're being told, quote, hold at all costs, which is a pretty daunting order to get, because uh, the German soldiers were not in a good mood after losing a lot of people around that castle, as you, as you can imagine. Um, the castle is still there, by the way. Today it's been totally rebuilt and refurbished. Um, it it uh, has three different functions. It has a restaurant, government offices, and a museum. A very good museum of the Battle of the Bulge that I would recommend to you if you ever travel there. Um, Meanwhile, what happens to, uh, to Fuller and his group up at the Clara Valles? They get rustled out of there on the evening of the 17th, and it's a, it's a chaotic mess. It's just a free-for-all. If you can imagine this kind of rectangular hotel, I think it's about three or four stories high, something like that. It's built up against a ridge, up against that western ridge that's the, the, the border of the town. And um, here are tanks literally kind of poking their muzzles into the windows. And blowing, you know, just, just shooting shells up and down the hallways of the of the uh, of the hotel. The guys are running away from these shells, and you have German infantry who are getting in, and they're screaming and hollering. It's it's so chaotic. It's it's a free for all. So the Americans are just flushed like quail from there. I mean, they're trying to fight back, but they really can't. It's a headquarters group, for gosh sakes, you know. And uh, you know, Fuller and a group of other of guys around him are on the, on the top floor, and they, they escape on a fire escape. Uh, it's like. If you can imagine, it's like a metal ladder that extends horizontally to the ridge. And then you kind of jump over the last few feet and hang onto the ridge. And that's what this 50-year-old colonel and a lot of the other guys around him are doing, and many of them do escape. One of them uh, lost his footing and fell down to the, to the street below, somehow survived, was wounded in the basement and captured. Uh, so, uh, so the Germans have Clairvaux then by the evening of uh, the 17th and early 18th. Um, their timetable, as you've already sensed, is completely blown. Uh, to make matters worse for them, 
General Troy Middleton, who was the commanding officer of the 8th Corps that controlled all these, uh, you know, the 28th Division and others, um, was setting up reinforcements uh, to the west to, to impede the, uh, the Germans. And if you could uh, move on to the next map, please. Okay. Now, this is several miles west of Clairvaux now. If you were to take the road west out of Clairvaux, this is where you would end up, at this place called Antioneuschaft. I like to think that Antioneuschaft is a lot like Chancellorsville. Uh, there's nothing there except it's a place to go as you're getting to somewhere else, but as it turns out through the vagaries of history, a great battle is fought there. Um, again, there's just like a house right there at the crossroads, just like at Chancellorsville in, uh, in Virginia. Well, um, <clears throat> so the Germans spend the rest of that night, uh, the 17th and then into the 18th, sending elements of 2nd Panzer west, here towards Antioch and And what Middleton had been doing, scraping together whatever he could of CCR and sending it here to these, uh, these two key uh, road crossroads, here at Antioch and and then uh, another one I'll talk about in a moment here at the Feitch Crossroads at Allerborn. Uh, and that's where CCR is going to make its stand. Uh, what has happened to the 28th in the meantime? The 28th is not dead. Uh, it's been folded back, peeled back. 112th has retreated to the north uh, after holding off the Germans. The other regiment, the 109th, is farther to the south. And interestingly enough, it's under the command of uh, Lieutenant Colonel James Earl Rudder. Many of you know him as Rudder's Rangers. Uh, he had uh, just assumed command of the 109th, so he peels back to the south. And then the 110th is just like overwhelmed and, uh, and fights in the manner I've illustrated. But groups of these guys from all the regiments, but particularly the 110, uh, are escaping west in places like this. And some of them are fighting with CCR, some of them are filtering back to Bastogne, Wilts, a hundred other places. Okay? Some of them get captured, some of them are never heard from again, still listed as MIA. Uh, some of them end up hooking up with their unit. Uh, the division commander, General Norman Dutch Coda, is able to hold together his division. His division is not annihilated, but, it, but it's fractured, it's fragmented. It's going to take him a while to recover. So 28th isn't necessarily off the board, so to speak, but it's heavily damaged, and especially the 110th Infantry. So really, all that stands between the Germans and uh, Bastogne, about 10 miles in this direction over here, on that afternoon of the 18th, is CCR. That's it. That's Middleton's last throw of the dice. Uh, and in particular, at Antio Nushoff, it's Task Force Rose, under Captain Lyle Rose. Uh, and um, some of you may you know, know what these symbols mean. You know, you've got armored inf company of armored infantry, you've got a company of tanks, you've got some engineers here. The armored infantry are mainly dismounted in foxholes or next to the tanks. The tanks uh, are, are spread out around the, the crossroads and, at key points. And that's it. They're going to take on the better part of two entire uh, German tank battalions that move into position by late morning into the early afternoon. Um, the commander of CCR was Colonel Joseph Duke Gilbreth, and he knew that uh, Task Force Rose was overmatched, and throughout the day, as Task Force Rose was just getting chewed up uh, in a horrible uh, close quarters battle, uh, Gilbreth called uh, Middleton, General Middleton, and, and just, just besieged him. He said, can, uh, can they retreat? You know, because if I don't get Task Force Rose out of there, they're all going to be gone. Um, so he asked for permission to withdraw. And Middleton had to really think long and hard about that. And you can imagine what that would feel like for the general now. He, he's a combat experienced general. He's a pretty good commander. He knows what it means to say, no, you have to stay there. You know, he thinks about it and says, we can't withdraw. If we do, they'll get to Bastogne, and who knows what will happen after that. And Corps headquarters is still at Bastogne at that point. Uh, so he said, no, you must remain in place, which is basically consigning Task Force Rose to death. Right? And that's, that's what happens here. These guys fight to extinction uh, at about midday, mid-afternoon uh, on December the 18th. Tanks fought at point-blank range. Infantrymen hurled themselves at tanks uh, around Antioch. The records reflect that, and many accounts do too. Uh, Task Force Rose held out for about seven hours, seven very valuable hours. Okay, so once the Germans get past them, then they go this direction, as the map indicates. And now they're at the Feitch Crossroads at here at Alamore. Okay. This is the next key crossroads they've got to get. When they get this one, it's a, it's a clear open ride to Bastogne. It's like a perpendicular T-junction there. 
at, uh, at the Fight Crossroads. Uh, now this is Task Force Harper, under Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Harper. Um, and uh, he's got a company of tanks, a company of armored infantry, as you, as you see, plus he's got odds and ends from the 28th Division, guys who have escaped west and, uh, and are in place, many of them up and down the road here, especially here at Allerborn. Um, there's a, uh, the, at this point, the 110th uh, is now under a new commander because uh, Fuller is just, just totally wandering around, uh, you know, cut off, lost, eventually captured. Lieutenant Colonel, or excuse me, Colonel Ted Seeley is now in command, and he's in this uh, like a shabby little house here that still stands uh, there at Allerborn, just west of the Fight Crossroads. You've got vehicles up and down the, the road here, uh, and at, at nighttime, the Germans just, just fall apart. Um, and here's a first-hand account from an eyewitness. So enemy tanks fired into several vehicles, setting them afire. The burning vehicles lighted the area, revealing the positions of other vehicles. Uh, the CP received a direct hit, uh, and then many more after that. Uh, CP just gets shelled repeatedly. Uh, most of it's armor-piercing shells, so it just goes straight through, but it's still it's extremely terrifying. There's a cluster of people inside. Um, and they're taking cover, they're trying to shoot back. Uh, in the meantime, the German tanks are up and down the road, just firing into the jeeps, crushing them under their treads, uh, shooting people up. <clears throat> Again, it's another chaotic scene. It's like the armored version of what happened at the Clara Vallis Hotel. Um, Seeley uh, gets captured, Harper gets killed as he's trying to escape with a, with a group of armored infantry. Uh, and it's just, again, uh, it's just a total mess, but by you know, they hold out for a few hours that gets us into December 19th. Um, what had happened to Lieutenant Colonel Strickler? Uh, he had been a kind of a troubleshooter during this whole thing. Had been wandering around trying to inform Fuller what was going on. So at this point, Strickler is, uh, is a, in an exodus too. He's trying to get out westward and eventually does. And he will assume command of the 110th. So he'll be, he'll be the third commander in just a few days of the 110th Infantry. Um, so basically what's happened here you know, in this part of our story, in the map, CCR has sacrificed itself to buy Middleton about half a day, half to three quarters of a day. Okay. CCR is done. Okay. They have a few tanks left that are going to filter back into Bastogne. They have some vehicles. They've got Gilbreth still. Um, they've got another group that's wandering around in a, in a town called Moynette, but they're about to get ambushed too and mostly destroyed. Um, CCR is what you know, professional military folks would call combat ineffective at this point. Uh, they have sacrificed themselves. Their casualty rates are 60% and upwards. Um, so it leads to the, to the last part of this uh, breakneck race for Bastogne. Uh, and if you could, could move to the, the next part. Okay. There, there you see uh, the town itself and uh, the approaches to the town. Okay. Uh, this is our situation by uh, the, the early... Uh, morning hours of December 19th, 1944. Now, Manteuffel's columns have been badly depleted. Uh, it's been three days of unexpectedly bitter, tough fighting, but these columns are pretty formidable. Um, and that evening, they are rolling west, getting closer to Bastogne by the hour. And here's where it all culminates into uh, a violent climax that, that plays out over those next couple of days on the 19th and 20th. Okay, because as the Germans are rolling west, Mainly along these three uh, avenues, or two avenues of advance here, and eventually up here. Okay. American reinforcements are getting into place. And what's happened the previous three days has bought them enough time to get into place. Uh, if, the, if none of that had happened, there's no way these guys would have gotten to Bastogne in time. Not a chance. Okay. you get got basically two units that are coming into place. The 101st Airborne Division, which has had to come from its rest camp, so, so to speak, at Mormelon. Uh, they've just gotten out of combat from the... Uh, you know, from a terrible fall campaign in, uh, in Holland. Okay. And you've got CCB of the 10th Armor, which was part of Patton's 3rd Army and had been diverted north at breakneck speed to try and get into Bastogne and provide some armored, uh, armored opposition to this German advance. Okay, now, CCB of the, of the 10th Armored, Combat Command B, is under the command of Colonel William Roberts. Uh, Colonel William Roberts, a, a very much a, a wise, older commander. Uh, Colonel Roberts, splits his, his uh, uh, unit up into three combined arms teams. As you can see, uh, as you look at our map here, 
Okay, but he calls them teams. There's Team O'Hara right down here. And again, these are combined arms teams, tank infantry, and in some cases, engineer teams. Team O'Hara is under uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Smiling Jim O'Hara. Uh, he is the CO of the 54th Armored Infantry Battalion. He's called Smiling Jim because he has a habit of always smiling, regardless of what the mood is and what he's talking about. Uh, he just has a tendency to smile at people, even in the gravest of circumstances. Some of his men found it very amusing, kind of liked that, kind of rolled with it. Others were a little creeped out by it. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets the nickname Smiling Jim. All right, so um, the unit, he has a lot of his own 54th uh, Armored Infantry Battalion, plus he has Sherman tanks from the 3rd Tank Battalion. Uh, he takes up station here along the N34 Road, uh, just south of Mar V, uh, here at Bras, and he's right in the way of Panzer Lair, which is going to come up that road, uh, and mainly in, in this avenue of advance. So what you're going to have there, uh, as December 19th unfolds, is, is a fight, uh, an armor-heavy fight between uh, Team O'Hara on one side and Panzer Lair on the other, okay? But you're also going to have infantry involved here, too, particularly from the I Company, 501st Parachute Infantry, uh, that fights in Warden, you know, almost to extinction, against uh, a battalion plus uh, from Panzer Lair uh, that goes on throughout December 19th. A desperate, desperate fight there. All right, now, um, a little farther to the north, uh, the team that really has quite a rough deal is Team Cherry, under Lieutenant Colonel Henry Cherry. He's the commander of the 3rd Tank Battalion. Uh, so uh, he's got a combined arms force as well from uh, his 3rd Tank Battalion. And also uh, he's got armored infantry with him as well. Now, now <clears throat> on the evening of the, the 19th, they're moving uh, east along the N12 road there. Okay? Uh, and they're supposed to go to Longville where the remnants of CCR had taken refuge. Colonel Gilbreth was there, and uh, many of his survivors, and they were just battered by that point in time, that evening of the 19th. So here comes Teams Cherry, not really knowing at all what they're getting into, honestly. I have no clue. And so Cherry finally gets to Gilbreth's command post in Longville. Longville has this uh, like, like onion uh, church. Uh, it's almost like an Eastern Orthodox looking church. It doesn't have a spire. It's got like an onion spire. Um, and uh, so in the, in the shadow of the church, they meet, and uh, you know, Gilbert thinks, oh, thank God these guys are here. They're finally going to relieve my destroyed command, and they're going to set up east of here, and everything's going to be okay. And Cherry is like, whoa, that's not really what we're here to do. You know, we heard that, uh, that uh, you've got a strong line in place here, and we're just simply to reinforce you and to develop the situation. You know, and Gilbert's heart sinks. He thinks that he's got to get his guys out of there that night, so at first he gives the order to do that, but it, it has the potential for turning into a route, so he stops it. So you've got a real traffic jam here along the road. And that's your situation in the daylight hours of the 19th, when elements of three German divisions hit them on either side of the road. And it's mainly, it's not really like a, an infantry to infantry fight. Um, what's happened is a lot of Panzer Lair had, uh, had moved around here to Marguerite behind Team Cherry. So Team Cherry is more or less cut off by the 19th and eventually figures out, my gosh, we've got to fight our way westward back into Bastogne. And the Germans then, okay, yeah, they're over here at Marguerite, but they're also up here. You can see there's our ominous arrows again. <laughs> you can see on either side. And so what that means is it's basically like self-propelled artillery and it's tanks uh, several hundred yards off the roads in good firing position, just, just shooting up and down that line of vehicles. Uh, for them, it's like a shooting gallery because it's just packed with, with tanks and jeeps and trucks and uh, personnel carriers and trailers and all the kind of uh, vehicles that you'd have with, a, with an American armored unit. Okay? Plus, you've got dismounted infantry on either side of the road trying to do things, but they're mainly under a shell fire. Uh, the worst of the fighting happens um, at, a, at a grotto just west of, of Longville, like at a, at a turn in the road. There's this old grotto uh, with, a, with a kind of stone siding, almost like a canyon-like siding, uh, and it's got a gate, and it's got religious uh, statues and symbols uh, within the grotto and clustered around on the, the cliff sides and all. And uh, you can imagine the effect of the German shells, uh, armor-piercing armor and high-explosive shells that come in and hit along those, uh, all along the, the cliff faces and the rocks. 
uh, just like uh, most of the survivors testified to just this screeching sound, uh, and fragmentation effect that multiplies the rocks as, as they just shatter off there. So it sends the infantry uh, just undercover wherever they can get it, but uh, the casualty rates are pretty pretty high. Uh, there's there's one soldier uh, who was an engineer and had been and had been told, well, you may have to blow up a bridge, a key bridge that's uh, sort of along the road here. He's dismounted. He's looking for a way to do that. All of a sudden, here comes a shell. Just blows up above him, and he's out cold for several minutes. When he comes to, um, he feels this tickling uh, on his neck, and he thinks that a German soldier is there with a bayonet, you know, trying to wake him up. Well, instead, it is his, the remnants of his left arm that have been crooked behind him, and it's, he sees his humerus bone sticking out, and he's just... It's like his, his, he's been distorted in this fashion, and the medics get to him. They get him sort of back to the road, but things are so chaotic that no one could do that much for him. They give him a little morphine, but he's in tremendous pain, so he's trying to just hold his damaged arm to his side, and, he's, he's, and a lot of the column is retreating, and he's wanting to get out, and uh, he, you know, he finally finds a, a, a half-track and opens with his, with his good arm, opens the back door to the, the half-track, and he sees a radio operator in there and says, can I come in? And, Guy says yes, and so you know the, this engineer just collapses on the on the floor of the half track, and blood is pouring out of his wound. And the radio operator just takes one look at him and just just vomits. It's like, oh man, he's just, just not ready for that sight. Uh, the the wounded soldier did get out. Uh, he gets treated near Bastogne, and he got out uh, just before the town got surrounded um, and was able to survive. And he kept his arm too. Um, yeah. Uh, Team Cherry takes, I would say, something in order of about 50% casualties. Uh, they're going to fight their way, the remnants of them are going to fight their way out on the morning of December 20th and get back into the perimeter that the 101st primarily has set up here, as you can see, set up in the town at that point, uh, the 501st in this sector and of course the 506th up here. Uh, the, team, the remnants of Team Cherry will get back and, uh, and continue the fight and serve as the armored and self-propelled artillery support for, uh, for the paratroopers. Um, then you had Team Desabry up here at Novo. And in some ways, that's the most compelling story of all, uh, of CCB, of what happens to them there. Um, Team Desabry is under the command of Major William Desabry, uh, who was 26 years old, uh, all of 26 years old, in command of the 20th Armored Infantry Battalion. Uh, he <coughs> was the son of a soldier, a West Pointer. He was a family rebel that didn't go to West Point and went to ROTC at Georgetown University instead. Gets his uh, commission and uh, had served very successfully and, and ascended to battalion command. He's younger than a lot of his men. And he looks it. Uh, he's six foot four, he's gangly, about 160 pounds, very skinny guy, very amiable kind of person, uh, a very competent commander. Um, on the evening of the 19th, Roberts sends him in uh, to Noville, right up this N15 road here. Uh, Desabry doesn't know what he's getting into. Uh, after all, he knows the Germans already have the town. He has to fight for it. He just doesn't know. But he gets in uneventfully that evening, uh, by the early morning hours of the 19th. Uh, so he's got he's got most of his 20th Armored Infantry, and he's got tanks from the 3rd Tank Battalion. I think like 17, 20 tanks or something. Okay, so he sets up in and around the town here. Okay, what's happening uh, as we approach dawn? is that the better part of the 2nd Panzer Division, the German 2nd Panzer Division, remember those same guys who have fought all the way from Dasburg through Clairvaux, kind of wasted CCR, and now here they come. Okay, they've diverted this way. You can see, you know, Panzer Lair, 26 folks, Grenadier, and all, they, they deal with Team Jerry. Okay, 2nd uh, Panzer goes this way, and Dasburg ends up fighting anywhere, depending upon what estimate you read, anywhere between one-third to one-half of 2nd Panzer. Remember, this is an understrength, uh, basically equivalent of a battalion. There's about 450, 500 guys there right, taking on these powerful forces. Uh, the little crossroads town is just ruined uh, of Novo. It's just, it's just a shambles by now. The Germans have shelled it so heavily. Uh, tanks could hardly move in the rubble. You've got smoke, fog, and mist uh, shrouding everything. Infantry are fighting at close quarters with tanks. So in this case, infantry could be very dangerous to tanks. In that environment, because the German infantry are getting slaughtered as they, they move in close to Noville, so you got German tanks that are uh, just kind of alone moving around and very vulnerable to uh, to American infantrymen who are wielding bazookas or, or firing rifle grenades or sometimes getting close enough to drop grenades down hatches or in in, uh, in openings or things like that. 
Um, Germans attacked repeatedly. Uh, tanks and tank destroyers, just like at Clairvaux and elsewhere, fought uh, at ranges within 50 yards uh, of one another. Uh, you know, it's just an absolute mess in, in Noville throughout the morning of December 19th. But uh, Team Desabri hangs on. Uh, they hang on all around this town. By that time, by afternoon, uh, most of the 101st Airborne Division has gotten into the Bastogne and is starting to, to move around to, to set up those defenses eastward here and to reinforce CCB. Um, <clears throat> so what happens is that 1st Battalion of the 506th Infantry uh, gets the job of going up the road and reinforcing Desabri that afternoon of uh, December 19th. Now they're under Lieutenant Colonel Joseph LaPrade. Uh, so LaPrade leads his people straight up that road. A lot of them don't have adequate ammo or, uh, or clothing or footgear at this point. They've just come from Mormelon. Uh, so uh, Desabri sends uh, what's called his S4 officer, his supply officer, out to scrounge up anything he can for these guys. Uh, and he does so. He pulls up a couple of trucks and a jeep, uh, and he, you know, and he's got all this ammo that the paratroopers gratefully receive. Uh, they move into to Noville, and you know, communication being what it is, uh, most of Desabri's people have no idea the paratroopers are coming, and so some of them sight their tank guns on these guys coming up the N15. They're like, hmm, those could be Germans coming. But fortunately for for the paratroopers, uh, a lot of the 10th Armored guys. Uh, had, had trained at Fort Benning uh, and knew the look of paratroopers and I uh, said, oh, okay, those are U.S. paratroopers. Those are our guys. So they didn't, didn't have a friendly fire incident. So here come the paratroopers hooking up with these tank guys and La Parade and Desabri um, immediately had this chemistry. Both of them were very much uh, down and dirty fighting kind of officers. And um, they both agreed that they had to launch an attack because Noville if you can imagine, it's, it's just this little crossroads collection of buildings down in, in low ground. And then outside the town, it's, it's like gently sloping ground uh, up onto these ridges around town, surrounding it, clustered around it. So, you know, if you, do, if you just sit there in the town, the Germans are going to be able to shell you from those ridges and have that high ground, and you'll be miserable. So, La Parade and Desabri both want that high ground. And in the afternoon of the 19th, uh, right around 2 o'clock, they launch a, a joint armored infantry attack, and they do it at the exact moment the Germans are launching their own attack to take <laughs> Noville. So here come the Germans with plenty more tanks, plenty more infantry, all this artillery fire, and it's just, again, it's another free-for-all uh, that I can't really describe to you with words. Uh, it's just unbelievable what goes on there, of close-in fighting with infantry and tanks, tank versus tank. It's a total mess. It's all uh, shrouded in smoke because there's so many explosions. Uh, this whole thing eventually resolves itself into another stalemate. Uh, the Germans cannot get into the town, uh, but they can cut it off, and they do. Okay, so by the end of the day on the 19th, they've cut off Noville from the Bastogne perimeter, which is emerging at that point. Um, and late on that day, uh, and I think it was even after the sun had set, the the, uh, the Germans uh, spotted what they thought was Desabri's command post, uh, and the reason they thought that is that um, one of the vehicles was pulled up right in front of the, the building, which was kind of a dead giveaway. So, and Desabri had been really raising hell with his guys not to do that all day long. So here comes an, another guy sort of making that mistake, pulling up right up alongside, kind of a dead giveaway. So here's German tankers. They spot that. They put two shells right into the command post, and it just shatters everything inside there. Uh, it killed La Parade and a badly wounded Desabri. He had uh, his eyeball hanging down his cheek, he'd been uh, concussed, he, he had shrapnel wounds uh, up and down his body. Uh, his, uh, one of his intelligence specialists, uh, Sergeant Larry Stein, uh, was also in there. Larry Stein was a very interesting uh, person. He had fled Nazi Germany. He was a German Jew whose family had uh, been terribly persecuted. He had joined the army here. They kind of become an American that way. And he's in there, and he's buried underneath uh, the tables and chairs that are in there, uh, but, but otherwise unhurt. And all he can think about is, where's my helmet, where's my rifle? I told you he's a good soldier. Uh, so they pull out the survivors, uh, but now it's like, well, who's in command? Uh, so the, the second in command in both cases have to, have to take over. It's Houston for, the, for Team Desabri, and the, the Americans just hold out there all night. Uh, it's just an uneasy un, uh, stalemate that goes on to December 20th. Well, 
But they eventually do, even as the rest of the perimeter is holding off on the 20th. Uh, this combined tank infantry team, airborne and 10th armored, fights its way uh, through the German lines uh, on the, in the afternoon of December 20th and gets back into the perimeter. Uh, and it's quite a story how <laughs> that happens. The, I think the, one of the best first-hand accounts, there's two really good first-hand accounts you can read about what that was like. Donald Burgett, whom I, whom I referred to earlier, who was an A company in the 506, and Donald Ador, who was a communication soldier in Team Decibri. Uh, it tells you exactly what it was like along that road. Just a crazy situation, sort of careening off the road, uh, through the muddy fields and snow, and getting back into the, the perimeter. Also do some other, uh, and, and make it out. Um, so by this time, uh, once you get late in the day on December 20th and the 21st, the town is, uh, Bastogne is starting to be surrounded. Um, uh, General Middleton and the Corps headquarters have left. Uh, it's now the 101st and CCB of the 10th Armored, the remnants of CCR. There's some 28th Division guys who are in there called the uh, uh, Team Snafu, uh, just the, the survivors, and you all know what that meant. Um, and at this point, there was an interesting communication among the Germans. Um, Colonel Meinrad uh, von Lauter, who was the commander of 2nd Panzer, uh, radioed to one of his superiors uh, and asked for permission to drive on Bastogne. Now remember, it's, it's von Lauter who's captured Noville finally late in the day on the 20th. He says, all right, should I move into Bastogne? And the reply is, quote, forget Bastogne and head for the mirrors. Uh, and I really think that's kind of a, a sim really more than symbolic, it's significant uh, because Bastogne, by late in the day on the 20th, to the Germans, just simply did not mean as much. And it was time to go north rather than south here. Okay? Even as they're getting ensnared into this, this uh, desperate siege. Okay? So the Germans are now enmeshed in a test of wills. And a test of wills with some of the best units in the United States Army, some of the best soldiers uh, who are determined to hold out. Okay? And they're going to do it even though they're cut off from supplies for several days. Uh, within Bastogne, they're going to do it in spite of horrible weather and tremendous danger. Um, and really, it's become now, Bastogne has a political objective, and it's one that they probably can't win. Okay, so uh, this has happened thanks to the efforts, again, the 28th Division, CCR of the 9th Armored, CCB of the 10th Armored, and uh, major portions of the 101st Airborne Division, too. Uh, that in some cases, this is some of the toughest fighting some of these guys have immediately when they get there and are involved in this, this desperate struggle for Bastogne over the first couple of days. And um, that being said, um, in popular memory, when we think of Bastogne, we tend to think of 101st Airborne Division. And, uh, and they're the ones who had received most of the, most of the medals and citations, uh, and deservedly so. But um, I also am hoping that after hearing sort of the rest of the story, you'll, you'll keep a place in your, in your memory for some of those other units. Uh, that experienced a, a terrible Alamo and the Ardennes, uh, just outside of Bastogne and these other places that we discussed. Um, nowadays, when you go to the, the Bastogne Corridor, uh, it's, it's very, very peaceful. And there's monuments, uh, there, there's markers, there's statues that adorn the region to, uh, to help you recollect what's happened there. Uh, they give nice, mute testimony to these momentous events that took place there. Um, but one of the things you notice is that the ghosts are never far away. Um, the ghosts are always there in the, in the Bastogne Corridor. They're there in the rebuilt churches, the rebuilt barns, um, the homes, many of which have had to be rebuilt, the castle in places like Clairvaux, the road net, uh, the roads that are many of them just as small as they were back then. Uh, and any visitor immediately senses this, uh, the ghosts of what had happened there. Um, and the, the, how monumental the events were. Um, the ghosts are there in lonely woods <laughs> around the Ora River and around these uh, perhaps previously nameless towns and outside of Bastogne, especially here in the woods north near Foy. Um, I like to think that those ghosts are the unheard voices of, of those who died young uh, so that others might live in freedom. And I'll just leave you with one thought tonight. Uh, I hope that the ghosts may never be forgotten. Thank you. Our uh, three veterans on the panel 
are Charlie Haug from Minnesota, Sleepy Eye, and we'll have him talk about that, and the 112th Regiment, 28th uh, Division. Bob Yanda uh, was in the 10th uh, Combat Command B, 10th Armored Division, and uh, one of the guys I've enjoyed working with so much with air shows and other things is Herb Seworth, who, if you've ever watched the Band of Brothers, you actually see him interviewed in uh, one of the uh, one of the segments there. And Herb has done great things in organizing the construction of monuments, many uh, that we have visited with our battlefield tours, and. Uh, very thankful for him to uh, come. And Terry, thank you for bringing him tonight very much. Uh, tell us about your hometown, your induction into the military, and how you got assigned <coughs> to the unit that you fought with. I'm Charlie Hall. I was born and raised on a farm near Medelia, Minnesota. And when I was about 19 years old, I got a job working in a bank in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. I still live there today. I worked in the bank about six months and I got drafted into the Army at Fort Schilling here. I came up here and I was one day and I was given a 30-day furlough with pay. <laughs> I think I'm the only soldier that ever got a 30-day furlough after one day. What happened? The second day they gave me a physical and I had the mumps. My cheeks and my chin was all swollen up and they said we can't send you to training with the mumps. You go home for 30 days and when I come back I got a check for $60 for being home at the most. <laughs> and well then, I went in, from there I went down to Mineral Wells to Camp Walters, which took basic training in the infantry. And while I was there, I qualified to go to ASTP, that's the Army Specialized Training Unit, which is a college deal. And I got to go to college at Baylor University for one full year. And I thought I was going to be something, but I got done, it was still a but private. <laughs> and so they sent me for more training back in the infantry. And by September 1944, I was sent overseas. Because they now had the D-Day, and um, they, needed, they needed replacements. It took about a month to get across France. I was with a group of about three, 4,000 replacements, and we got up to the Hurtgen Forest. The 28th Division went into Hurricane Forest on November 1st, 1944, and they were driven out by the Germans by November 10th. And that's when I went in November 11th as a replacement with the 28th Division. Company B, 112th Regiment, there was only 30 men left out of the 200 that started out 10 days before. They would not talk to us. They said this. We asked them questions about combat and said, you'll find out soon enough. <laughs> they said, just uh, be thankful for each day you're alive because within two weeks you're all going to be dead anyway. So that was my initiation into the 28th Infantry Division. And all of a sudden my number came up and I decided uh, as I got closer and closer, I decided, well, I'd be enlisted. Uh, so I did and uh, I enlisted and uh, Went down to Fort Snelling and uh, from Fort Snelling I got on a little troop train and went down to Fort Benny. I had a selection. I could try to side rather than the infantry and that's how I joined the armored division. So I went into the armored division and uh, uh, we got down to Fort Benny, Georgia in the Sand Hill area down there. And uh, took a basic training down there throughout there. Went up at Division Headquarters of the 10th uh, Armored Division, and then from there on we were, I went into Combat Command B, which is a half a division, or a brigade, uh, approximately 78,000 men. And uh, I was very fortunate at the time. I had, first I had a General Ross, who was a commander, and we had about 99 people in our headquarters. And then from there on, we got into, we had uh, General Roberts, or he was then a bird colonel when he first came in. And uh, so General Roberts was quite a guy. He, uh, 
had taught Eisenhower and Omar Bradley had commanded General Staff School in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which is a big strategy place, and he was a strategist. And so I was really fortunate. I really enjoyed the man. He was the most un-GI man I've ever seen in my life. He used to sit around the, the CP and his toes would come out of his socks. <laughs> So that, that was overseas, and that, I had a, he and I were the only ones, I had a land of autographs. This was a, uh, it was a, I had gone to school at National Cash Register, they were the manufacturers of it. It made maps, it was principally for desert navigation. Well, the maps were so doggone good over in Europe, they're because they had so many wars. You didn't need a land autograph. So all it was is transportation. And <coughs> transportation, which I could only get one more because of the gyro compass in the back and the plotting table. I could only get one more person in the back of the Jeep plus the driver and myself. But uh, so I was very fortunate. They were, those items were chipped or shipped to accompany troops on the USS Black when we we did not land in the invasion. We landed at Sherbourne shortly after the invasion. Bob, how did you get into the intelligence section of the headquarters? Uh, well, actually, the, you know, they just kind of fell into it, I guess you might say. Uh, there, were, there were places that were vacant, and then then I also got into uh, to uh, uh, to, to different schools that I had went to, and so as a result, uh, and then I also went into the ESTP program too. Oh, you were in the ESTP, okay. Yeah. Well, where did you go to your ESTP training? In Auburn, Alabama Polytechnic Institute, better known as Auburn. Auburn, no. <laughs> sure, sure. And I'll point out... A-U-B-U-R-N. Uh, <laughs> War Eagle. That's uh, our, that's our... I'll point out, uh, uh, Bob brought back with him, he's got uh, the situation maps that some of his intel people put together from uh, the 19th, uh, or actually the 16th, I don't know if he's got in the right order, but it, it goes through there. I'm a, I'm a native Chicagoan, born and raised there, was an only child, went through all Catholic uh, grammar school, grade school, and was and high school, and then uh, had matriculated to Marquette University in uh, September of 1942. That was, if you recall your dates, uh, that's about 12 months, or 10 months after Pearl Harbor. I enlisted in the Army <clears throat> at the age of 18, and two months. Uh, being an only child, I had a little trouble with my mother and dad agreeing to me go, but uh, uh, everyone knew that anyone in the 18-year-old bracket or all over was going to go. And I enlisted rather than be drafted. Uh, I really didn't know much about the Corps of Engineers, but I thought, well, I'm going to be a mechanical engineer, which I later did get a degree in. But the 101st, uh, approximately oh, maybe three, four, five days after what we referred to as Roosevelt's Christmas during World War II. Uh, and it was just in time, uh, the e, com e Company had come back off of the line up in Holland and was sort of licking its wounds and getting replacements, of which I was, I was one. And uh, I was lucky enough, I, if any of you have seen the Band of Brothers of the movie or read the book, uh, I, I, I was lucky to bunk next to a guy by the name of uh, One Lung McClung. It was the best shot in the whole, in the whole uh, army, I think, because I later picked up some of his uh, work in the woods. So, uh, anyhow, uh, I, I, I remember vividly the night when we got to notice. Uh, it was a Sunday night, and I don't know in return, or, or what what date that was, but it, I think it was the 17th, the night of the 17th, that Buck Taylor, our, command, our platoon sergeant, came in and said, we're going up. 
I didn't know what he meant, but everybody else in the, in the platoon did because they started getting out there what, what little they had because, remember, they hadn't been resupplied. They were still in their uh, summer uniforms. So, yeah, very, very poorly. I was lucky. I came back. I came from England, so I had a rifle. It hadn't been zeroed. I zeroed it up on the line in Bastogne. Uh, little things like that. One of the things, uh, uh, one, a couple of things that I, I'd like to dramatize just a little bit. Can you imagine all of the fighting that we talked about here in this past hour and a half going on in a drizzle of fog with very sometimes 50, 50 foot visibility and even less and the temperature was 33 degrees. It was probably about as miserable as you could get in a combination of weather and ice and snow. We got into the trucks in that morning, the follow, well, following afternoon, and rode for 18 hours. And they were, they were grain, everyone knows in this audience, I'm sure, what a grain truck looks like. That's what we rode in for 18 hours with no cover. We got out, and someone said, where are we? And there was a sign that said Bastogne, and no one paid much attention to it. We headed up the road to Foy. And I don't want to belittle any of this, the tremendous fighting and heroic stuff that went on. What we saw was an American army in retreat. Guys with no helmets, no rifles, no weapons of any sort whatsoever coming down the road that we were heading up and we were out coming out of Foy, going up to, uh, coming up out of Bastogne, heading to Foy. And all of a sudden, the column stopped like that. There was no one ahead of us, and they're gone. And the next thing I heard, my first experience in combat, I heard a thing called a burp gun. And I knew exactly what it was. No one had to tell me. The next thing I heard was a, something, something that sounded like a whirring. And it hit in the mud about 20 feet away from us. And the guy in front of me, Frankie Mellet, who was later killed in the attack on Foy, said to me, I said, to Frankie, what the heck is that? He says, oh, that was a mortar shell. He said, it didn't go off. They fire a lot of duds. <laughs> okay. So that's my, that was my early experience in Bastogne. Charlie, can you explain what happened to you uh, on the 16th and, and that fighting that uh, John had described? Well, as I said, on the 15th was a very quiet day from the night. There was no flare shot up, but 5.30 in the morning of the 16th, suddenly behind the pillboxes about a mile or so was a whole string of searchlights. The Germans had shot them up in the air at an angle, and it was foggy and cloudy. The lights hit the clouds, and they took them right down on our lines. And we looked back and forth. It was just like daylight or moonlight all over our 28th Division. And we looked ahead into German lines, it was cold black. That went on for a half hour, and then the artillery came. Right where I was, it wasn't too bad, but north of us and south of us, heavy artillery. That lasted a half hour. Then, all of a sudden, we had two outposts way out in front of us, at Luzkampen, with three men in each one. They had a telephone to call back, and all of a sudden, they said, there's German soldiers approaching our position. We heard a bunch of shooting, and all three of our guys were killed, and that was the end of that. A few minutes later, the other three guys called back, and the same thing, and they were killed. Our company commander, the captain, Stanley, whatever his name was, uh, he said, i got to see what's going on. So he took one of the runners, he ran up to the front lines where everybody was, and he got on a tree stump, stood looking out to, to see if he could see what was coming. And of course the Germans saw him and they shot him and killed him. The runner went back to the CP and got our two medics. They ran out there and they were both shot and killed. So in the first half hour of the battle, we lost our company commander, Captain Stanley Dick, and our two medics. Then we were next in line and here they come. And this went on from 7 o'clock until 11 o'clock. We held our lines but we were getting heavy, heavy casualties. And 
At 11 o'clock, one of our men shot the, one of the German officers that was yelling commands, and suddenly we saw about 40 white flags out of the ditch in front of us, waving at us. And they surrendered, and all the shooting stopped, and I was given the job to help search these surrenders to these boys. They were all young boys, teenage boys, I would say 15, 16 years old, and they spoke English. And they were so happy because they didn't want to shoot anymore either. And they said, are there prison camps near New York City? <laughs> and we said, yes, there is. I think, he said, can you promise us that's where we're going to go? And I said, yeah, I promise you, that's where we're going to go. <laughs> so we got two of our guys to take these back. The thing we didn't know, A Company was on our right. And by noon of that, December 16th, every man in A Company had either been killed, captured, or wounded. And the Germans had circled around behind us. And we sent our two guards back with these 40 young boys. And the Germans shot our two guards and they took all these 40 boys back in the army so they never got to New York. <laughs> well, that was the first part. Well, then we saw the Germans. We estimated there were 200 German bodies out in front of our position and 100 firemen that were wounded. We saw the Germans coming with stretchers. And so we did the same thing. We, we, we found we had uh, 60 of our men killed and 40 wounded. So we brought them into Lutzkampen and put them in the building. We thought that was it. We thought that was the end of it. All of a sudden, here come a whole string of tanks and trucks. We counted about 15 tanks coming first, and then about 15 trucks. But this time, it wasn't the boys. It was the big German army coming down the hill right to us. And five of them went up to the 106th Division north of us. Five of them went south of us, and five of them come right into our town. And at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, here they come. And as John mentioned, the first tank had a flamethrower on it. And right in front of our eyes, he blasted in, and three guys were on fire, and they crawled out of their holes and burned to death right before our eyes. Well, then this Anna tank gun that John mentioned for the 106th Division started firing. We counted 12 shots, and he knocked out all five tanks. First one, he got the first tank first, and the fifth tank, and then he kept firing, and he knocked out all five of them. All the Germans coming behind ran back into Lutzkampen, and there we were. We were just held our, it was dark, and we held our position. The next morning, we expected a big attack coming, because all night we could hear more tanks and more trucks coming into Lutzkampen, and we were just a couple hundred yards back. But. What happened, nothing happened. So the first sergeant said, I want two men to go back to the 229th Field Artillery and have a shell at Lutzkampen because it's just full of Germans. He said, I want two volunteers. Nobody would volunteer. He said, okay, Charlie, you are one, and Ken Gianni from Kansas, you're the other one. And we started back. And he said, you'll find an outpost about a half a mile back you know, where we can call back to the artillery. We got there and we found two helmets, two rifles, two cartridge belts, and a smashed telephone laying on the ground, so the Germans had captured them over the night. Then we started going back, and here was two tanks, German tanks, spotted us. And, they, and I didn't think they'd use the big cannons on us, but they did. They fired first machine guns, and we could see the snow jumping. Then they started with the big machine guns. We had an armor reunion. Howie Flynn was there in 1992, and he heard the can Jenny tell about it? And he said, as the two of them were running from the tanks, he said, normally when a man runs, his legs go back and forth. But he said, I was running behind Charlie, and his legs are making complete circles. He said. <laughs> <laughs> we got into a ravine, and the tanks quit firing. And first thing we knew, we were at the 229th Field Artillery, and we told them our message. They said, we don't have a single shell left. We don't have any shells, a chance of getting any more. And he said, the Germans have now come and cut off between you and the B Company, so you go with us back to Orn to Colonel Nelson. We reported to Colonel Nelson on the evening of the 17th, and he said, what was your job? I said, well, I was a messenger, a platoon runner. He said, well, my two messengers were just killed. He said, and you and this Ken, he said, you're my messengers. <laughs> so for the next three days, I traveled with the Colonel Nelson, and he was always back a little further than the rest of them, but we set up many, every town we came to, we set up, and all our machine guns, everything we had, we would set until the Germans come, and we would hold them off till the tanks came, and every time the tanks came with flamethrowers, we'd retreat to the next town. 
I got a list, I'm not going to read it, but I got a list here. Eight towns that we went through from the December 18th to December 25th. December 25th, 4 o'clock in the morning, we ran into the 82nd Airborne. And we'd been behind the lines then about eight days with no food and it was all frozen feet. I just had a light jacket because the first sergeant made me throw my heavy overcoat. But he said, you've got to run fast to get this message back. And lo and behold, the 82nd Airborne had a big turkey dinner with dressing and mashed potatoes and gravy. And they invited us to come and join them before their next battle. So every day at Christmas, I think about this turkey dinner. Bob, uh, after, uh, after the, the attack and you were established in Bastogne, can you talk about some of the things that you did uh, with the headquarters in Bastogne? Yeah. Actually, when I was in uh, in Bastogne, my job was to run liaison between the uh, 10th Armored Division and uh, the 101 Airport. And uh, so, actually, uh, I kept going back and forth and back and forth and between on a daily basis and taking the situations off their maps and bringing them the situations off my map. I, I, I handle basically uh, intelligence, uh, uh, the German operations, and I picked off their German operations and got them with the maps that I have here right now. And so uh, it, it was a very interesting thing. I was there when General McAuliffe wrote the, uh, the, the Germans asked to, uh, to surrender to his headquarters. And he replied with the eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper run off on a mimeograph machine. Nuts. And they didn't know what that was all about. <laughs> it took them about uh, a week or so before they got back to headquarters they could figure out what nuts was. <laughs> and it was just a, it was just a farce, you know. <laughs> He's just telling him to go, f you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but you were in uh, McCullough's headquarters when he uh, gave that answer. Yes, right. I was right there. And we, they ran it off, and I took back uh, copies of it to the battalion and uh, gave them every, handed them out, the original copies, and handed it out to all the battalions. And I kept four or five of myself. <laughs> but the funny part about that was we wound up in Garmish and the war, war was over. And I, had those, I had a rack on the back of my Jeep. This is a lion autograph that I had. And, uh, we, um, and I had a lot of champagne and little booze in there and what have you. And, uh, plus a little loot, like a Luger and a P-38 and a few nice shotguns. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when the war was over, uh, all, the, all the guards and everybody were celebrating and they saw that booze in there and what have you. And, you know, what are you going to do? They took it, they just looted the whole thing right out of there, you know. They didn't have anything left. But I didn't care because the war was over. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it, it, was a, it was kind of an interesting situation. But uh, there were a few interesting things that happened and one of the most Although I received two uh, bronze stars for bravery, uh, one of the most important things that ever happened to me was when I was running liaison from uh, Combat Command B headquarters to, uh, uh, to the 101 Air Airborne headquarters. Uh, I was going along the road, and Daniels, who was my Jeep driver, and I heard a slight Help. And I get Daniel's pull over here. I see I hear somebody saying help. I pulled in there and uh, so here on the I, I got out of the Jeep and walked up and kept on getting a little louder as I got there. And uh, here's a fella leaning under part of the building had been shot down by eighty eight and a piano had stopped the floor from going any further. He's laying underneath there, but he's wounded. He's, a, he's not wounded real seriously, but he's wounded. You can't move or anything. And there's a, just enough a little place for him to get air and what have you. Now all of a sudden there's a fire creeping toward him. 
So I kind of helped organize her, and we got together, and we uh, we could get that fire out, and he's going to fry right there. And so we oh, finally uh, went to the half tracks, and they had canvas buckets. A lot of you will remember. We got some of those, and we got anything that would carry water. And then we located a pump, or a pump about oh, about 75 yards away, something like that. And we started, uh, we got the picks out of the half track and started picking a little hole around so we could get out of there. And uh, so, uh, but the fire kept coming. And so that bucket brigade that we started, we finally wound up with about 20 people in the bucket brigade. And, you know, I was right at the end there talking to them all the time because it was the first one to talk to them. And uh, so, by golly, finally we got enough water around them to douse that fire. And we got the we, we picked him out of there with uh, the picks. And uh, then the medics came. And they had a stretcher, and he picked him up onto the stretcher. And uh, you know, it's the greatest satisfaction I ever had in my life, and the greatest satisfaction in the army. When we got this fellow up, I, I had the stretcher in the I had the stretcher in the beginning or the right hand, and the other fellow had it in the other hand, and he turned over. And he kissed me on this hand. I will never forget that for the rest of my life. Now you didn't get into your positions in, uh, in the Foy area until what the 18th. Yeah, uh, we we came walked uh, you know marched right through uh, Foy. I mean uh, right Bastogne. through Bastogne, and then short of Foy, the firefight was going on there as the tank. Uh, uh, command was was drawing, and we we had uh, we w we went to the Bojack Woods uh, and dug in in those positions, and we were in a position where all of the spent ammunition being fired on both sides was coming over our our holes while we were digging holes. So. It was uh, it was a, interesting. I'd never had a lot of never had any uh, 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 rifle fire that was spent going overhead and going and of course you had to keep digging your holes. So I dug that hole and that was literally my home in Bastogne. I left that just a day or two. This, the same day that I was wounded, had gone back, had left, had left it once in order to make a sweep of the woods out in front of Bastogne, and uh, it had been, we'd been attacked by uh, a reinforced, reinforced uh, German uh, company, uh, platoon rather, and that was a sad thing for them, as it, they left 28 dead out of 40, and uh, we, and one of the memorable things that I occurred and I've never had a uh, my platoon leader was a guy by the name of Ed Shames whose name is writ written in the book and uh, he uh, he sent me out into no man's land on Christmas day to bury a crop and I've never have gotten a good answer out of him and I keep asking him that every time I talk to him so he's still alive but anyhow that was uh, that was uh, part of uh, my experience in uh, Bastogne every night Every night it was shells, screaming memes. One of the things was uh, was a uh, uh, buzz bombs. We'd hear them going up, 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 up over the head and for the age, and then just well, probably after they had just cleared our lines, they'd stop, and that meant they were on the dive path to to uh, Liège. I remember when the B-17 bombers came over and they were shot. They got hit by uh, an aircraft fire, crop fire, and here we are, all surrounded, and we're standing out there counting the parachutes coming out. You know, praying that everyone that you know the ten that were in the 17 would get out of there. So uh, that was, I guess that's about what. You know, well, any, uh, any other uh, thing you want? Uh, to a lot of us that went on the tour, if you remember, two years ago, 
we stood in your foxhole. Marco showed us where your foxhole was. And, uh, and one of the things that I want to say, uh, Herb, you correct me, but uh, the Band of Brothers still uh, conducts USO type tours to Iraq. I think uh, you just Five talked about them. Five of them were in Iraq in, uh, in uh, September. September. So <coughs> they're still going back over and paying tribute to the guys that are fighting for our uh, freedom. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.